close to the edge of the city of Islamabad, there is this desolate spot. Today, there's nothing special about this place. But for years and years, there stood an ancient banyan tree here. It was the highest and the widest of all the trees in this area. And some believed that the Buddha, in his wanderings, had once rested under the tree and had blessed it with longevity. And so some of the Buddhists used to sit under the tree and meditate once in a while. Ten years ago, the tree was burned to the ground by the students of a nearby religious school. This was the shed that housed the statue of the Buddha. They destroyed it and broke down the statue within it many times. Finally, the Buddhists just stopped coming here. But that was not the end. The religious students in their newfound zeal wanted to do more. So they started to burn the tree down, bit by bit. It took them more than a year to burn the whole tree down. Once catching them in the act, I asked them, why are you doing this? One of them replied, the Christians worship this tree, therefore we are going to burn it down. I tried to clarify saying, it's not really the Christians, it's the Buddhists who worship under the tree. Doesn't matter, he said, they're all the same. They're all kafirs, non-believers. I went to the police, wrote articles, many others did too, but the tree is gone. Many years later, when I visit this place with my children, I worry about where this country is going. Teenage onwards, having spent almost four decades with religious and spiritual groups around the world, I see patterns in Pakistan that make me worried. I see the space shrinking for minorities. I see forced conversions. I see the breaking down of hundreds of primary schools for girls. And I see killings. The blood of thousands shed in the streets, in the markets, even in the mosques. This is not the Pakistan that I grew up in. And I know that this has to do with us losing touch with the 9,000 years of pluralism in our society. This has to do with a newfound and growing belief that all Pakistanis belong to or should belong to the same religious orientation. I bring my children here to show them the challenges that their generation will have to face. They ask me to tell the story of the banyan tree. I do. For this is the story of their own roots, the tremendously diverse roots that go back thousands of years. There are signs of human habitation in the Potwar Plateau around River Savan, dating back to over a hundred thousand years. However, the earliest fully developed civilization known in the area is that of Mehrgar, from around 9,000 years ago. Not much is known about its spirituality, but we know that there was a strong presence of the goddess here. Respect for nature, exquisite art forms, creativity and aesthetics that we find here are typical of the goddess cultures around the world. A few thousand years later, about 5,000 years ago, the goddess shows up equally strongly in the Indus Valley civilizations like Monjodaro and Harappa. Other than the goddess, 
There are several seals found in the Indus Valley excavations with clear images of deities on them. The cult of Pashupati, the worship of the Lingam and the Yoni, and the practices of yoga all have their roots in the Indus Valley culture and are therefore much older than the coming of the Aryans, the Brahmans, in the area and therefore predate the beginning of what we now know as Hinduism. The whole tradition of temples and of devoting temples to particular divine forms, to gods and goddesses, is pre-Aryan and non-Aryan in nature. Aryans, the Brahmins and the Kshatris, arrived here much after the Indus Valley civilizations from Central Asia, around three and a half thousand years ago. Aryans were not indigenous to this area. They used the Sanskrit language and wrote the four Vedas, which later became the backbone of classical Hinduism. The Brahmins assimilated the local population through an assimilation of their local gods and goddesses into their hierarchical social order. This order placed the Brahmins in the highest caste and the local population, people of this land, in the lowest castes. Aryans had a very nomadic orientation. They did not build temples. It was the people of this land who built temples and who had devotional traditions. These traditions later developed into devotional bhakti and it developed even more clearly in the heart-level spirituality of the Sufis. Around 26, 2700 years ago, in response to Brahman assimilation and hierarchy, there are two formal religions that developed in the subcontinent. These were Buddhism and Jainism. Jainism did not survive as much, but we find Jain temples all across the country. From this one in Texala, all the way to the southern end of Pakistan, like the Jain temples in Nagar Parker. Till quite recently, there was this ancient Jain temple in Lahore. In 1992, there were Hindu-Muslim riots in India related to the destruction of the Babri Mosque. In reaction, people destroyed many Hindu temples in Pakistan. Ironically and unfortunately, they also destroyed this Jain temple in Lahore. Buddhism remained very strong in the northern half of the country for a very long time. This is evident in the most impressive Gandhara remains here at Texala, along with many other sites across the country. Both Buddhism and Jainism broke down the caste system of the Brahman Hinduism, both based on the principles of equality, coexistence and peace. This is Debel, present-day Bambor in Sindh. In the first century of Islam, this is the place where the Muslim armies led by Muhammad bin Qasim first entered the subcontinent.
This pathway is known as Babul Islam or the gateway of Islam. Here in Bambur, we have a contender for the site of what is probably the first mosque in the subcontinent. Only a few hundred meters from the mosque is the site of the first temple that was unfortunately broken by the Muslim armies before they even set foot on the subcontinent. They destroyed it using a catapult carried in one of their ships. Close to Rori and Sakkar in northern Sindh, we find the remains of another ancient mosque, which is believed to be the first mosque in the subcontinent. This one is called Muhammad bin Qasim Mosque. He was the one who ordered its construction. When the Muslim armies arrived here after conquering and establishing their hold over most of Sindh, Islamic rule was established in parts of Sindh within the first century of Islam. It is however generally accepted that the spread of Islam in the subcontinent was not because of the invasion of the Muslim armies. It was primarily due to the tremendous influence of the mystics of Islam, the Sufis. Basic nature of Islam in the subcontinent has always been in line with the very tolerant and pluralistic spirit of the Sufis, which was in turn close to the indigenous sense of the spirit of this land over thousands of years. The fanatic streaks that we witness today are a more recent development. They are not really rooted in the ancient spiritual attitudes and the sentiments of the people of this land. There is this peaceful shrine of Mia Mir in Lahore. He is a Sufi who is said to have been invited to Amritsar to lay down the foundation stone of the Golden Temple of the Sikhs. Nanak's message like that of the Sufis is very much in line with the underlying spirituality here. In fact, it appears that what Nanak turned into a religion was just the sense of the spirit in the everyday life of this land. Another tradition that is a couple of thousand years old is that of the Jogis. The spirituality of the Jogis had very deep and well-developed roots 
in the local devotional traditions of Shiva and gurus like Guru Goraknath. Out of the thousands of shrines and temples of the Jogi tradition all over the subcontinent, the most central was this temple here, close to Jhelum, known as Tilla Jogya. It is situated at the highest point of the Potwar Plateau. Thousands of mystics belonging to the 12 different pants or the schools of yogis used to walk this path and gather here once a year. These gatherings continued till only a few decades ago. The list of specific spiritual traditions can go on and on. Today also, there's a wide range of religious and spiritual sentiments in Pakistan. They range from thousands of years old indigenous devotional traditions to more formalized Brahman Hinduism, to the Christians, the Parsis, the Ismailis, Shias, Boras, Sunnis, Wahhabis. And within and besides these religious identities, people who generally recognize the value of mystical poetry, of shrines and holy men or women irrespective of which formalized religious streak they belong to. This is Pakistan, the hidden face of Pakistan. This is the face that the global media would not show. They tend to portray a very two-dimensional picture of one relatively fanatic version of religion in Pakistan. Unfortunately, there are groups inside the country that also like to reinforce the narrow, two-dimensional face of Pakistan. To me, that is not true. To me, this is Pakistan, the hidden face of Pakistan. I make sure that my children are not listening to these new religious scholars trying to reintroduce, to redefine our religion for us. I want them to stay connected with their pluralistic roots, with all the pluralistic elements of our everyday spirituality. To that end, I have identified the core elements of our spirituality that are necessary to reclaim the pluralistic heritage of our lives. In my book, Tariqat, I go over each one of them to guide our youth for a better tomorrow. Tariqat outlines the seven basic elements of spirituality in Pakistan that are common to most people, whether they belong to this or that religious orientation. Seven elements of Tariqat are love, relationships, submission, the sacred in names and forms, pluralism, the sacred in everyday life, and creativity. Almost all the spiritual poetry in the area has taken characters from the romantic folklore to talk about spirituality. People have always understood that personal love can become a vehicle for divine love. Opening of the heart and connecting with someone 
outside of oneself can allow one to shed the ego, to go beyond the outer self and connect with the deeper divine truth within. The softness and the openness of the heart in the Sufi heritage of this land led to people connecting with each other with tolerance and with love. This is very different from the fanatic version of religion that we are being taught today, which leads to a hardening of the heart, rigidity, divisions, arrogance and violence. Lives of people of this land revolve more than anything else around relationships within the family and the community. With an ever-present sense of a heart-level interconnectedness. This is a lived experience of Hakukul Ibad, of people's rights and responsibilities towards each other. This is not about being virtuous or doing something spiritual. Spirituality was lived here. Tawakkul has to do with the submission of one's intellect, with the submission of one's will in favor of the divine will. It has been central in Sufism and in the collective psyche of this land. This leads to an ability to accept where one is and what one has as coming from God. There is a time for everything and everything happens according to His will. This results in tremendous resilience in times of hardship. But this is perhaps the one attribute of our everyday spirituality that has been the most abused by those who wanted to dominate and control people, by those who wanted to disempower people. In fact, God would want us to do what we can first and then to show tawakkul. As the Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, once said to a Bedouin, you tie your camel first then you leave it in the trust of, in the hands of God. There is this ancient and popular indigenous tendency to connect with devotion to a form of the divine. This as opposed to believing in the nameless, formless God like Brahma of the not-so-popular Vedantic tradition. The earlier tendencies in Islam may have been to not treat any person or object as more sacred than any other. But in Pakistan today, this personal connection to a sacred form, to persons, places and objects that are treated as sacred, shows up all over. It shows up in the moving poetry of the mystics, just like it did over thousands of years in the traditions of bhakti and temple worship. If not kept in balance, it also allows people to give their lives and also to take lives in the name of devotion to a person or a book. Close to Rori, the temple of Kalikamai, like many temples across the country, is visited regularly by both Hindus and Muslims, and it sits peacefully across a huge madrasa. The tendency to connect with the divine through sacred forms, with love and devotion, was always given temperance and balance through a deeper understanding of pluralism. There was an understanding always that all the forms were only a reflection of the spirit underlying and therefore interconnected. There was 
a respect for all sacred forms and that allowed for a peaceful and a respectful coexistence. earlier times, the whole world was seen as a body of the goddess. We were rooted to, connected to the land. In the popular Sufi sentiments of this land, there is this concept of Vahadatul Vajud, of unity of being, where all things are connected, united in their essence, in the Divine. When the Divine is present everywhere, in everyday life, the ploughing of the land and its harvest becomes sacred. And the living spirit also flows through the celebrations that follow. We have had spirited celebrations full of colors, music and passion. If the beauty of this world is a reflection of the divine, then adding to that beauty becomes a sacred act. Similarly, creativity as an attribute of the divine is reflected in us. Though we may be losing it in the urban settings, creativity and aesthetics have been central to life here. They continue to soften the heart, to keep the spirit flowing in our midst, from the overtly spiritual poetry and music of the Sufis, to the traditional dances, dresses, decorations. Aesthetics remain the language of the heart and the spirit, and the spirit lives on. Religion and spirituality have organically evolved in this land, woven into our everyday lives. We just need to stay connected to all the elements of our local spirituality and keep them in balance. This will help us get away from our recent monolithic and violent tendencies and nurture in every individual the roots of pluralism that we have inherited over 9,000 years. The banyan tree that the Buddha sat under may be long gone, but the soil that it sank its roots into is still there. The soil that nurtured that tree, that soil is a part of this land. That soil is a part of who we are. And in that, the roots of the tree are connected to our roots, and together we live on, in a pluralistic reality, in a pluralistic vision, of what Pakistan has been and could continue to be.